to take some uh, lighter subject, speak about something, something that is not necessarily uh, a thing that you we need every day. I mean, we see recursion every day in terms of like we get this on the evaluation knowledge questions and we see this on some kind of uh, uh, like when we get hired and then we tend to forget or we get the recursion as basically something that we it's there somewhere we might use it but it's pretty interesting subject and i wanted to to make it a bit more lighter subject in terms of, okay, let's not maybe bring it to production. So uh, the first things first, uh, we have a bit of disclaimer. Don't use this in production. This is something that we will, uh, probably your team lead or someone will uh, scream at you if you bring it to the merge request. But by all means, if you want to break your own interpreter, go ahead it's fun uh with that being said uh we can start so first thing first what is recursion that we basically take for granted so that this ability in modern in modern languages is it's the ability to for some part of the code to call itself uh in a recursive way. So it call, call, calls itself and get some result from like maybe from uh, a task of a bit smaller complexity. So we are, are able to get something. We don't know what is it yet, but we might get uh, information if we will call the same thing for something a bit smaller. And eventually, we will work out our uh, our result from the very bottom uh, by adding it. And then we have this very simple and uh, very common example of factorial function. This is something that we need to reach down for something that we only know. Like, OK, like we ask factorial, what, what is it factorial for 5? And the function says, I don't know, ask me for four maybe. So it asks for four. And then and finally, if it's one, yeah, I know that. So that's how it works. And what it really gives us is that for some sorts of problems, the recursion becomes a clean and easy and a nice way in terms of reading the code to deal with the subject. Sometimes it's just easier to read than doing this in uh, with iterative way. So there's this, <clears throat> I'm to maybe I, I'm not to bright a person to understand it fully, uh, but there is a mathematic uh, prove that we can use uh, recursion and uh, iteration inter interchangeably, but the result in terms of code might be different for different examples. And there is class of examples, a class of problems where recursion just shines. So uh, let's stick to that. Uh, how is it even possible that we have recursion? We take it from gr for granted that we get it always, but for like early the early languages, early programming languages, it was not the case. Like first Fortran didn't have it for a simple reason. If you define a code like this, you define a function, and uh, inside of that function, suddenly we referred to something. But wait, we haven't yet finished uh, implementing and defining that function. It's not there yet for the compiler, for example. How does it know that? So like the first programming languages didn't really allow for that. And then we had this second, this idea, like, okay, we have a compiler that runs two passes. So the second pass will actually pick up everything that's not yet 
referring to anything and search for the table and try to make something for it. But how does the Python do it? Uh, we can see, okay, we see that it doesn't, but we can go to the code and try to figure out how does it work, right? So uh, wait a second, I did break something. All right, so we have, uh, let me tell, tell me if you see the code, maybe I will make it a bit bigger here. And we have, uh, we have uh, the interpreter here. So we have the same factorial function here. I will run it to uh, paste it to the interpreter. We'll see how it goes. So let's run it. Uh, for example, for one, it will become one, for two, it will be two, and for three, it will be six, because this is how it works. Uh, but what does the Python do in between? How does it know that the Python, like the factorial that it refers, it's there? Turns out it doesn't, but for Python, it doesn't have to run twice the same thing, because it's running, uh, it's resolving namespaces on the runtime. And this is like the first thing I wanted to, for you to like see, or you might be, you might be familiar with this, but this is like the um, part of language, part of the library that is not really seen often. It's not really very useful for production, but it might be useful for learning, for just tinkering, for playing around. So we have the Python disassembler. And this one was able to go through code and spill out what is the actual bytecode that runs a Python interpreter on the virtual machine uh, in terms of very basic operations. So let's do that. Let's run this on uh, on our function and we'll see how it goes. So this is list of operations that run that runs that 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 is our function in terms of bytecode that is being run. It's fun for so for example to run this assembler against different solutions to see uh, how many instructions it generates. So if you have like, for example, this conversation, whether this is, whether uh, list comprehensions act actually make sense or we can use the loops, uh, just dis disassemble both and see what's the difference there. But here for factorial, you can see we use this, like you see this very important line, it's, on the runtime, suddenly the interpreter runs the load global. It tries to find the function or the identifier by name, and then it will be calling that at some point. So this is like kind of a magic. We don't have to do anything. Everything will be resolved at uh, runtime. So. The same thing goes for like this is actually some kind of a price of that. So if we have something we re, we mm, run or we create a function that we use something undefined. Obviously, our linters will scream at us, but maybe you don't have a linter. You try to run something that is not defined, and then you have. Uh, run the broken and obviously you don't have this name so uh, because it's running at the real time when when on the runtime uh, once more uh, sorry what did I do wrong mm. yep yeah, right rule of the demo so Yeah, so we have uh, this assembler, uh, it's loading the function, but 
yeah, so <laughs> it's fun uh, to play with this assembler, but we uh, don't have whole day for that. Let's go further. So we have this um, um, we have this magic of uh, of recursion, so we can actually run this hopefully forever, right? So let's see. But factorial of three we did have. Let's say for ten or. 100 is growing really fast for 1000 for 10000 and we reach uh, this issue so maybe you've seen this before but now we have this situation that well we've been promised something uh but but it's not really true like I wanted recursion. I wanted this to to last forever, and we have suddenly we have some uh, we have some limitations for that. We have to deal with this suddenly. If I wanted to make a factorial for a really large number, I cannot with this. I either have to reimagine my function, make it another way, but I really don't want to. What can we do in Python? What Python magic, we, can we apply just to bypass it, right? So first, um, let's see, why is it possible? Why, why is it happening? So we, I'm oh, sorry, so something happens too. Um, so as you can see, there is something called recursion limit and it's not allowing us to run any deeper. This is happening because Python, at least C Python uh, that we are using, is using stack. Stack is like this very old and tested uh, solution to, to many issues regarding like calling functions, getting their arguments. Uh, it's there for like we if you write programs in assembler in C, it's there. Python has its own stack, which means it doesn't really use the stack that is used by the processor, but it, it implements it in a similar way. So the stack is being used for putting any kind of variables that you have local for the function. When you call it, when you go back, you can pick it up. Uh, so it's a really nice place to have to, it's convenient and makes programming easier uh, just to have a place where you can drop your variables and then pick it up, you know, it's, it's going to be there. So lots of implementation details become easier. We will see this in a moment. But the thing is about stack is that it has a limit and we have to deal with that or like, try to bypass it somehow so um, and one more thing about stack is that like it was a actual design decision of the language because you can have language even python without stack but if you lose stack you will have to like to make the calls a different way and if you don't have stack you don't have the history of calls so if you are familiar with tracebacks Mm, there are, I don't know if you, you like tracebacks. I like tracebacks. I really love to see what's the history of my mistake to, to actually make it right. So if this wasn't there and I was just uh, basically doomed to my own understanding, it would take much more time for to, to, to fix any kind of issue. Stacks, uh, trace, uh, trace bugs are awesome, and I rather have them than infinite recursion. But let's have the infinite recursion. Let's make some Python magic around our functions, and let's try if we can to can do anything about it. So, can we stop using uh, using stack? Mm, let's see. Uh, first, first thing first is that when we say we always say Python is a fully object language. It, everything is an object. Functions can be objects. Uh, strings are objects. 
everything can be object classes are objects because they produces they, they are factories of, of objects so we can make but here's the thing stack is also an object and we can see it we can play with this we can see how it goes what is there so um, let's let's play with the stack first so um, we we'll go to uh to, to the uh, interpreter the first thing that we <laughs> want to see is how the stack looks like so the stack is something like we have this nice uh this nice uh module called inspect and this inspect module is i really recommend like going through that because if you want to tinker in interpreter you will find a lot of stuff there and if you want to dig into the documentation you will spend hours and hours there sometimes it will be just messy and sometimes it will be fun sometimes you will break your interpreter but the very first thing that we want we want to uh, see the stack so it's very easy to see. So we have this, and you see this is a list of objects <laughs> of a frame info uh, type, and they have some frame. They have some like code which is related. Where is it running? The line number, which function? So we have additional um, additional information or about what is actually being associated with this so it's really nice to have and apart from this like metadata we have the actual frame object here which we can further refer uh, as you can see i'm just i'm like running the python itself but we already have some stack size let's see what is it when length of the stack it's 13 so why is it uh because i'm running ipython and if i'm running ipython it's running some additional uh quirks some some uh, additional magic if i were to run just python uh the stack size would be one in that case but uh excuse me but here we're already somewhere uh, one another thing is that we can actually see how deep can we go with the stack because we can see the stack size like the defined one so we can import uh sys mm, i'll try to do it here uh, and from sys we have something like uh, recursion limit which is pretty misleading. I mean, it's obviously related, related to recursion, but it's not really, uh, it's not really limited to recursion. If you just go deep enough with your calls, you might reach it, but we'll see how soon can we reach it. So it's the stack, stack size for now, it's 3000. Uh, what can we do about it? Maybe we can change it. So turns out, yeah, uh, we can set the recursion limit to 4,000, for example, and now it's bigger. So the nice thing about Python, okay, we don't set, you don't really end up with the fixed stack size. So the very obvious solution would be just, okay, we wanted to have the factorial of 10,000. Let's say we have the size of 14, we're already here. So if we set uh, 10,000 and 20, uh, and one of 10,000, uh, it works. It's a big number. So it's cluttering the whole uh, screen, but it works. So yeah, problem solved, I guess. But what if someone comes with a million or something else, then maybe we could hack it forever, like to try and uh, increase the factorial number by 10 uh, until we uh, like 
and all the memory, but maybe we can do something smarter than that. So let's do something. Um, let's make our life even more complicated and say we'll see the recursion limit for 50. And so we reach this pretty quickly. So for example, we if we run the factorial for example for 20, it will work. But if we are at the depth of 14 plus 35, 34, 34 will work, but 35, we have the uh, limit already. So <clears throat> we are limited to the stack size of, uh, of 50 right now, and we have just 35 frames left. Uh, let's use it wisely. So what can we do with that? Uh, the first thing is that maybe we will try not to use stack. Let's try to do something like it's really it's really hard in Python not to use stack because C Python will use it internally. But maybe if we use it wisely, maybe if we jump out of the functions quick enough and do something with our results, intermediate results, maybe we can deal with that. So um, with that, uh, let's see, we have, uh, wait a second. So, sorry. Uh, so we have this and we have, uh, we can try, um, some something called um, that that's something called uh, tail recursion. Um, so we have another example. We have our factorial function, uh, which is slightly changed, and we have some kind of magical uh some kind of magical uh decorator that runs our code right now for us what are we doing here so as you can see we are using again we are using uh inspect module and we're using inspect module with one additional nice function which is to get us a current frame what are we doing with this frame well, the frames have several nice things. And the thing about frame is that it will have a reference to the frame before it. And that one will have the reference to the frame before it. So it's a linked list. So if we see that, OK, we have this frame and this frame before it, and this frame before it, code for it, is the same, which means we already run into recursion twice. So what do we do? Okay, let's let's just raise an exception. Let's uh, here if we cut catch this exception, let's write these uh, let's get these arguments from it, which are being used again. And let's try to run this forever. So the deal is that we um, we are able to now run this uh, like for your, uh, suddenly it works. But there are some fallbacks like there are some sorry maybe the wrong word there are some caveats for that so the thing about uh, the tail recursion and about this a particular uh, the creator is that the again uh, stack gives us a place to drop our variables and here we don't have such a place and the thing about the tail recursion itself and like in languages that really allow for it and optimize for it, they do it in the same frame. But the price for it is that if you do a tail recurs recursive call, I will 
for now I will just drop uh, the other one just to see for you to compare. So we have this one tailed and this one, the original one. <coughs> you can see that uh, we are actually doing something different. We are um, keeping some accumulator in the function. So suddenly function needs to take its own stuff with it and gather, like take care of gathering this. And that's uh, one of the um, drawbacks of the tail recursion that uh, we are forced to like the tail call. It's called tail because it's the last thing that is allowed to be run in the function and nothing else can be done. So if we run the tail recursive call, uh, we cannot do something like, okay, let's think by, by something. No, no. It, we need to like the, the tail recursive call. If we go back from it, this is the, this is it. So we need to run, re, rephrase our function. We need to rethink it. How do we really deal with the variables there and what with the uh, with the actual results? But I don't. I really don't would like to like not want this. I want Python magic. I want to run it in some runner. I want to maybe run some different kind of generator or decorator and be able to run it like that. I mean, Python has to have some magic. The other thing is that this is ugly. I mean, this is just like, this is like plumbing. This, I see all the wires around and maybe there's a better way to do it. Mm, so this gives us like another um, example, like another idea. So maybe that wasn't really the best idea, but this leads us to some uh, to some other ideas. So first things first is that what we've effectively did, we did run a um, while true. Uh, loop forever until it actually worked out. Like there was some exception handling, but basically we were at the very basic level, we replaced the recursion with iteration. Maybe it was really like working this uh, around the actual, uh, how it's supposed to be done, but effectively we, we were just running a loop on a function until, until we forced it to work but we can we can learn from that so as you can see this original factor example if we run the function we actually have everything we need to know about this function how it's supposed to be called so instead of this function calling itself maybe it can run something like uh, additional information for something outside to you know what run me with this so now we what we create what we do have to create is something which is a uh, no pattern and it's called a trampoline and the trampoline is called that because of how it works. So if you have reg regular stack, you have something like we, we call factorial three, it doesn't know, so it will call another one and then it will call another one. So you know the stack will grow. But with trampoline and with this solution, we have something that runs our code probably in a loop and it will run the factorial of three, but the factorial of three doesn't know, so it will call return with this additional uh, with this additional metadata and will say, okay, I don't know, but call me once again with two. So then trampoline goes, applies this, runs with two. So as you can see, it's like it, the pattern of the this graphical uh, graphs does look like a someone jumping on trampolines where you can achieve 
basically the same result, but with increasing the stack size only by one frame and back. Right. So um, basically, let's try to do it, but maybe with this additional thing, like let's not create additional classes, additional like tuples that say it. Let's try to leverage something from Python uh, that we have else. So we have, uh, if we are going to replace it with iteration, we might as well use some hacks on good old generators. So this is very similar to the example before. So we have the same factorial, but now we replace this factor in the factorial with a generator. The only thing that has changed here is that instead of running the factorial and calling it, we are, since this is a generator, sorry, I've messed up. This should be a factorial, factorial generator too. So this is running, running in the code. We'll go to the code in a moment. So it's running the yield and it's gener creating the generator and it's returning it to the other side. So let's go to the code because it look, looks better there. So we have our generator for factorial. And as you can see, it's here and it's running itself again. We can try to run it by hand just to see, because this is a lot of like, additional stuff that needs to be done let's see let's let's try to play with this first so we have factorial generator of let's say of this three uh sorry and what is it is it is a generator so if it's a generator we can try to run next on that uh, so f and now f2 is what? It's another generator. F uh, will be next f2 and f4 will be next of f. And now we have stop iteration with some kind of variable so now what we need to do what what happens here so instead of calling uh the function and increasing the stack we are just initializing initializing a new generator and yielding it back to our handler so the stack doesn't really increase, but we need to handle it somewhere. So eventually we need we want this return which star which triggers stop iteration. We want to catch this value and apply it to something that we had before, and we kind of need to fake fake it or like we kind of need to make it work. So this is our trampoline and again we have just like a while loop that will run our generators and there's some additional stuff there to just handle it so uh, as you can see we kind of light we are making our own stack it's smaller it's simpler but it's using a list so we are not really being um, really we're not being uh, restrained by the original stack. So what we are trying to do, like if there's no exception, we try to get the very last item from the stack, run the next on it, this, this the way we did. If it's a result, then it's fine. If it's stop operation, we will try to set the value. But if it's uh, the stale exception, uh, and if it's just stop it, if it's this, we will need to do something to that. So we need to add this to the stack again, and we will need to play around with this. So let's say 
how can we achieve this? So I will put everything here into the interpreter and now I can run of three and by magic of Python, it will work. So we effectively mm, replaced recursion with iteration with this power of this design that nifty created trampoline uh this this pattern that allows for infinite recursion but without the recursion but there's one thing left i mean mm, we still have to change our code right i mean we need to find the returns like we need to find the call for original call we need to go there and at least do like paste this yield and uh, around this because now it has to be a generator let's work i don't want to do that so maybe we can try some more python magic and we can try one more final step to uh, do it for us so by that i mean abstract syntax trees so abstract syntax trees are again very nice subject to dive in over the weekend and uh, then spend some time still wednesday uh, even because it's it's a very powerful thing at first it might be a bit daunting but i recommend to play with that just so we will have just a very simple example it turns out what is this, an abstract syntax tree so when you have a python code that you see every day it needs to be compiled in to the bytecode that you've seen at the very beginning of this presentation <clears throat> the thing is that it doesn't do it right just write that in terms of okay we don't just compile it directly to, to bytecode there is this intermediate state when all the tokens all the names all the tags that we have in python that you know like if while def are actually translated into a tree of syntax elements and they are being um, kept like that so <laughs> we we can look how this really works in a second let's say you have this part you have this factorial uh, example once more. Uh, we have this function. And once again, we go for a moment for the inspect module. So inspect, and we will get the source. So let's say. Um, But the source it's just the literal source of the file so it's a nice thing that the functions in python generally carry everything even with their source code that they are attached to but what we can do with the source is that we can try to parse it so we will import something called ast which stands for abstract syntax trees and we will try to parse this and see how it looks in this intermediate state. Mm. I will make it pretty right now. There is this method to dump the tree and say for and now print it. So this is our factorial function in, in this, uh, 
in this stage of being uh, abstract syntax tree. So you can see every element of the function is being represented here. So we have function definition. This is our def keyword, and this is the first line. We have the name, what arguments does it take with their names, and then we have the body of the method. We have even the top string that was there it's included. We have the if statement, we have the comparison with n and with the actual uh, sign for less than equal with what. So it's uh, maybe it's not the best way to read the code by a human, but it's a really nice way to go and modify and analyze the code with the code with the computer. So if you see this for the first time, it might be something that's OK. That's just too many letters, too many uh parents and it doesn't look well well trust me for the code it's really nice what if there's one thing that we know what we've learned uh in it business is how to traverse uh trees uh so we'll try to do just that we'll try to go through this stage of the function and automatically apply these changes. So maybe we will try to find our call to our function. And if we replace it with yield, it will work and to magically turn it into the generator. Uh, so we have this. We have. Uh, created a decorator to transform our function. And we do some magic with inspect. So we are getting the source. Here we are getting the source, but we need to remove the part that, because if we get the source from uh, the function along with the decorator, it will contain the decorator uh, part, the line. So we need to remove that. Uh, we will get the code from it. We will parse it as we did uh, in the example. And now we need to run the transformer. And the nice thing about AST is that you don't need to run it, like go through the tree yourself. You just declare what kind of, uh, what kind of tag you want to visit and what do you want to do with that? <laughs> So as you can see, this is our transformer. And this is not that important. The important is this one. So everything that re that starts with visit and some tag name will be um, triggered on an event if the traversal, traversal function uh, will stumble upon. So we visit all of the call um, operations in our function. What we do, we see the name of our self. We compare it with the function uh, here, ID, right? Uh, and if it's the same, let's, uh, instead of the call, let's return the yield instead of this. So effectively, what we are trying to do is we are trying to make this, but automatically. I don't want to like run through the code and do that by hand, but we have computers. So we, well, let's, sorry, I have a problem. With... Now, now you are seen everything. Well, uh, one second, I need to, yeah. So we have this one last step. Uh, we will try to run it as we were run before. So I will just paste here. And we have this factorial, but with the AST transformation right now. So it looks exactly as it was before. 
only difference is that there's a different uh, doc string. The code is the cell, the same. If I run it uh, like that with three, what did I get? Well, I will get the generator. That's uh, the unfortunate thing. We it's not working like that, but I can run the trample on that, and it works. And if we remember that we have this stack, this uh, get recursion meet it's 50 let's say we try to reach that and the one so we're good and uh, that's basically what i have for today so uh, i hope you found you found this subject interesting or fun for something like you can do in your own workshop just to like you know play uh, and break your code in sandbox environment don't bring it to production yet but there is a lot of uh, things that you can just learn uh, in in the Python world that might not be obvious or not be obviously mm, interesting or even like helpful for your day-to-day -day work when you just need to make like merge request one other after another or like do some templates of like the DTOs and the regular stuff. But uh, one day it might be helpful to just like get have, have this piece of knowledge that I've, you know, I've spent like one weekend uh, somewhere and I've broke my interpreter, but I've learned uh, this nice thing. So yeah, good luck. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, I hear one question. Uh, you have several times told us that you have broken your interpreter. What does it actually mean? That means that you just uh, receive errors in runtime or? No, no, like uh, maybe we'll try to do it. So let's see. Uh, one thing is that if you set the fact, like let's see, we have this uh, set uh, recursion limit to 10, uh, the interpreter will not let you, right? because it said it's too small, but there is this kind of a thing, like if I set this to like uh, a limit to like 30, it's fine. It seems everything is all right, but then if I define this, function once again as see we have here and run let's say 20 but, oh, sorry uh, then suddenly it comes out that uh, not even the recursion limit was uh, met but we were this recursion limit was exceeded during some calling some internals in Python and we just broke and the interpreter exited of normal. So yeah, there's a lot of things you can just break if you play with the sys, with the inspect. Uh, yeah, you can basically like Python uh, assumes that you are a consenting adult and since there's no privates, nothing like that, it will let you change it and then face the consequences. But still, if you run the interpreter, everything works fine as usual, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, but here, like if you run interpreter like normally, it's fine, but I've changed the uh, I've changed the uh, recursion limit and now I don't have the uh prompt anymore the process has died 
Yes, yes, right. But but this limit is saved like in memory. So if you restart your interpreter, it will still work. Yeah, yeah. If I restart my interpreter right now, like you won't break the executional, like you, you won't break the, the uh, executable. So if you run the Python once more, it's fine. It's fine. So it's safe. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, another question from my side. Uh, did you measure uh, which overhead uh, this uh, like uh, inspection adds? Okay, how much time? Mm, we... No, I don't know. Maybe that's a good idea. We could spend another like, hour on that and compare which actually, like which one is the faster one, fastest. I would expect the first one with jumping out of uh, the code with inspection and with checking the frames would be the slowest one because there's a lot of uh, look ahead and just throwing again uh, but yeah like again don't use it in production <laughs> Ask me no more questions. <laughs> 